Charles Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers, perhaps the most famous preacher of the modern age. Spurgeon's fame actually bewildered him. He was a self-described country boy whom God pulled from rural England to the streets of London at the age of 19 to preach to the world, and thousands came to hear him. But toward the end of his 40 years of preaching, the spiritual tide turned in Europe. Cynicism and skepticism became the norm. Many pastors and seminary professors feared they would lose churchgoers and students if they didn't do something. And so they tweaked the church and its message in order to make Christianity pleasing to a modern world. Spurgeon published a series of articles in 1887 called the Downgrade Articles. He likened truth to the top or highest point on an incline. And once a step was taken away from the truth, you're on the downgrade. And that downgrade is steep. One small step quickly leads to a fast slide downward toward an abandonment of true Christianity. The articles show that a moving from the inerrancy of Scripture toward rationalism, skepticism, scholarship, and worldly wisdom eroded evangelical churches until they were no longer true churches. Many churches had become lifeless museums, housing the gospel as a relic from the past. Their pastors spoke in an academic fashion using high rhetoric that the common man just couldn't understand. At the same time, Christianity was deemed as incompetent by a new modern world led by modern thinkers. And so church attendance declined. Church leaders reacted, and did they ever react? They abandoned prayer meetings. Doctrine was held in low regard. Sermons were kept short, and amusements became the norm. Churches were becoming more like playhouses, substituting theatrical values for biblical ones. Who was to blame? Preachers. Spurgeon said that too many ministers are toying with the deadly cobra of another gospel in the form of modern thought. Why did they do it? Well, there's only one answer. Pride. A leader of a church that was quickly losing ground with the public was seen as a failure. In order to keep a congregation, the church strived to entertain. Leaders' egos were stroked when the attendance numbers went back up, and because a congregation grew, their tactics were deemed effective. To gain and maintain a crowd was the goal, and success was measured in the counting of heads. It was the 19th century version of the church growth movement. Pragmatism was having its way. Pragmatism is the belief that if something gets results, then it's good. If short sermons, entertainment, and a less serious approach to biblical doctrine brought in the crowds, the pragmatist would say those things are useful to the church. As John MacArthur has said, theology takes a backseat to methodology. How important is theology anyway? Well, 12 books of the New Testament were written to churches in order to answer questions, fight heresies arising in those churches, thwart all false teachers and attackers, or reemphasize teaching that had already been delivered by the apostles. Jude, who intended to write to fellow believers about their faith, abandoned that idea when he discovered that false teachers were spreading their lies. Jude wrote, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It would appear that at least according to the Bible, a right understanding of the gospel is important. The same downgrade that plagued Spurgeon's day continues in America. When church attendance began to decline in the 1950s, many saw their purpose 
to maintain numbers rather than maintain biblical truth. And so the church growth movement provided solutions to pastors whose egos would not let them rely solely on Christ. They, as in Spurgeon's day, turned to worldly means to attract new additions. Now churches are constructed like theaters. Some operate like malls. Some have added coffee shops and restaurants, even going to Starbucks and McDonald's for franchise opportunities. Programming consultants, special effect people, lighting and sound effect experts, and drama and dance coaches, they're found in many locations. All right, Brian's going to lead us in the Holy Ghost Hokey Pokey. You put your right hand in, you dig your right hand out. You put it in, and you shake it, and you shake it all about. See the in a smoky room, the smell of wine and cheap perfume, for a smile. Experience the excitement of a live rodeo, indoor fireworks, all inside the sanctuary. This is the first time ever that I know of anywhere in the United States that's ever been an indoor a rodeo inside of a church. Oh yeah, Cabela's $250. Good job. Give them all a big hand, would you please? We want to meet you where you are. Want you to see, want to show you Jesus. Started out, and where was it again? Finished? Just down the street. Go so on, enjoy our thing. Take a glance, and then you'll be our guest. We are guests, be our guest. Woo, yeah! I love Ultimate Fighter. How many of you liked Ultimate Fighter? So, why is using different methods in the church in order to get people to show up so wrong, you may ask? If they come, you can preach the gospel to them. First, by adopting such a worldly approach, we directly violate the command of Scripture. We're not to appeal to man's worldliness for results. Listen to what the Bible says. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Again, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The wisdom of the world, according to the Bible, is foolishness with God. Secondly, a concentration on methods and numbers, which goes hand in hand with a lower view of biblical doctrine, allows for false teachers to invade by the ranks. Doctrinal beliefs are not considered as important in pastoral qualification as being fully skilled at growing the number of attendees. It's rather unfortunate that today, most seminaries have focused on training in church gimmickry than holding steadfast to biblical truths. Taking advantage of a lower guard, these teachers are allowed to preach some of the truth or none at all really doesn't matter as long as they're filling the building. They'll either leave out key components or they'll add to Scripture. That's what happened to the Galatians. False teachers came in and used some of the truths of the gospel, and then they added some things that they thought were logical. But when Paul found out about it, he had some doubt that even the Galatians were true Christians. Third, the goal and its methods soon erode the love of the gospel. The good news becomes so decayed it's no longer effective at saving the soul. 
This was seen at a recent sports rally for Christ in our local area. On tap for the evening were plenty of musicians and BMX bike riders who performed high-flying stunts. After the bike riders entertained for a while, a man addressed the crowd and said something to the effect, sorry to stop the show, but if we can remain seated for just a few minutes, I want to share something with you. This won't take long. He then proceeded to give a less than complete gospel in a matter of a few minutes. True to his word, the entertainment quickly resumed. How precious and glorious is this gospel if it has to be apologized for when it breaks the flow of entertainment. The gospel's no longer the attraction, but simply a commercial break. But because the numbers were high for the event, it was counted as a great success by organizers. But lastly, it simply does not work. Even to the pragmatist, the results are short term. To keep those we've gained by pleasing their flesh, well, you've got to maintain their attendance by continually giving them more and more. And to keep them pleased, the spectacle always has to be bigger and better. Or they'll just go where the show's more fascinating. It may seem to work in the short term when the crowds are good, but over time, people soon realize that church entertainment is merely a poor imitation of what the world has to offer. When the church no longer plays the world as good as the world does, people cast off the useless institution. And that's exactly what happened in England after churches refused to heed Spurgeon's call. Many of those churches are now mere shells empty buildings. There are not enough Christians to fill those buildings that exist today, and so churches are becoming museums, shops, and worship centers for religions such as Buddhism and Islam. At the current trend, it's expected that the number of British Baptists, the denomination that Mr. Spurgeon was a part of, will number only around 123,000. That's one-tenth of one percent of the projected population. Total attendance across all denominations have declined by over 90 percent. The same scenario is playing itself out in the United States. Oh, I know that our attendance numbers is much better than Europe and England specifically. But if we don't change, if something drastic does not happen in American Christianity, this too is our future. The surveys across the board show that church attendance is declining and fewer and fewer people are identifying themselves as Christian. The majority of youth growing up in our churches are leaving once they reach adulthood. Why? <laughs> Simple. The world is much more attractive to their sinful desires than the pseudo world offered by a local church. It's simply amazing that Christianity's fastest growth is occurring in China, a place where believers are persecuted, where they have to meet secretly. Churches there don't use worldliness as a draw. In fact, meeting with other Christians can mean certain death. England didn't take seriously the words of Charles Spurgeon and he was censured by the Baptist Union, who had benefited from his decades of preaching. He eventually left the organization. He was ridiculed, lampooned, and seen as a troublemaker. The controversy eventually took a toll on him, and his health rapidly declined. In 1892, at the age of 57, Spurgeon left this world to be with the Christ whom he loved and defended for 40 years in the pulpit. We can take heed to Spurgeon's word today. Spurgeon did see a solution to the problem. For the Christian, it's personal revival, a humbleness before Christ in repentance, and a renewal of the Spirit will get a man off the downgrade and on the upline. But for that to occur, 
A return to the simple truth of Scripture must first happen. We've got to trust in the simplicity of the gospel. For the unsaved man or woman who's been soothing their mind with a form of godliness, yet still not yielding to the gospel, well, the answer is the same. A humble repentance and a yielding to Jesus Christ instead of the ways of the world. At this point in our video series, we are merely sharing with you the issues and ingredients of what's making up this thing called the modern gospel. We eventually will share with you the simple gospel that Spurgeon preached and defended. In the next session, we're going to explore American revivalism. Another man made attempt to generate results that only generated disaster. I oft pondered the reason to